Unit 17, Part 10. The last two sections of Unit 17 can be taken together, and we're moving on to uh, Section 4 now, Categorical Relational Statements, Complex Subjects and Predicates. Uh, from 329, she starts the final section of the chapter, Symbolising English Sentences. It's all sort of the, the same thing. Um, the first point of advice she gives is to uh, remind you of the three-step procedure, which you should use again, um, for symbolizing English sentences where there's going to be several um, quantifiers involved in their symbolization. Uh, the, the really new thing that's going to happen is the in symbolizing these English categorical sentences um, is going to be the appearance of quantifiers in the middle of formulas. Right? So if you look at um, this one, this is the first example that she runs through, will run through it too. Some dogs wear collars, this one, 327. Um, then we'll run through example in 328. Any dog that wears a collar has an owner. Um, but uh, sh the first piece of advice she gives is um, the really crucial advice. Um, if you remember when we were from 12, units 12 and 13, we had categorical sentences and then categorical sentences with complex subjects and predicates in unit, unit 13. That was a very difficult chapter and this advice broke down a little bit. That is the advice, but you must in the main stick to this advice. The advice of the one, two, three step advice. One, um, identify the overall form of the sentence. Two, identify the subject and the predicate of the English sentence. And three, symbolize the subject and predicate. Right. First paragraph of this section. 327. Um, <clears throat> that's crucial, as I said then, uh, it's crucial now for the same reason, namely that there are going to be a bunch of symbols involved, right? Uh, lots of predicates, one place, two place, three place, various quantifiers getting stuck all over the place, and you want your final result to be of the right form, and you need to um, ask and answer the question, what is, what kind, if for categorical sentences, which is one of these ones throughout this rest of the book, section four and the five, section four and five are, they're all categoricals, um, what kind of categorical is it? So remember what a categorical sentence is from unit 12, a categorical sentence, we distinguish it from singular sentences where the subject was an individual, right? Um, so the subject is a named individual, that's a singular sentence, categorical sentence is one where the subject and the predicate class, the, the subject and the predicate of the sentence are both classes and it asserts an inclusion or an exclusion relation between those two classes. Getting more sophisticated into the analysis, we distinguished univer uh, universal or complete inclusion versus particular inclusion. So it's either some of the subject class are included or excluded from the predicate class or all of the subject class are included or excluded from the predicate class. That gave us our four kinds of categoricals, um, A and I from the word affirmo, universal inclusion, particular inclusion, and E and O from the word nego, universal exclusion, particular exclusion, right? Affirmo, nego, Latin for I affirm and I deny, right? Um, and the really crucial thing that did hold, even in Unit 13, the one, two, three step advice broke down towards the end with the bear with cubs that doesn't do this unless she's attacked. She's ill-tempered, well, ill-tempered unless she attacks it. Those examples at the end of 13 were complex, but what always remained in place was the combination of the universal, if you've got the universal quantifier, if it is a universal statement, so it's gonna begin with the, if it begins with the universal quantifier, um, you are very likely to have made a mistake if you don't have the conditional as the major operator of the propositional function bound by that universal quantifier. So if it's a universal statement, you want the major operator of the propositional function to be a conditional. That always stays in place. Right? That was, if you recall the form, I'm sure you do recall because you're a top gun, uh, that was the form of the A and the E. Right? The A was just... Uh, right, the, the, the four forms of our categorical, if you remember, were um, right. Right. 
A form, I form, right? Universal inclusion, particular inclusion, E form, O form, universal exclusion, particular exclusion. And we had subject and predicate you could plug in here and here into these forms. And in unit 13, we learned how to do this with really complex subjects and predicates. We're going to have really, really complex subjects and predicates in uh, relational predicate logic. And they're going to have quantifiers in the in extra quantifiers, right? Here, of course, we just have the one quantifier on the outside. We're going to have quantifiers in the, the predicate. Um, we're going to have that in our first example for the th th uh, 327. Some dogs wear collars. We're going to have a quantifier in the predicate. And in the next example, in 328, we're going to have quantifiers in the subject uh, and the predicate, actually although in a more complex way in the subject, in the quite complex example from 328. Um, okay, so it is very important. It's a very crucial lesson to um, have the overall form in place, right? And especially to hold on to the connection between universal quantifier and the hook and the existential and the dot, right? Existential, probably, very, very likely, the major operator of the propositional function should be the dot. Okay, consider the sentence. Some dogs wear collars, okay? Uh, MPL, monadic predicate logic, as Clank runs through on page 327 here. This is the um, translation you would be given, that, that you would give, that you would have to give, excuse me, with only the resources of monadic predicate logic, right? Some dogs wear collars, clearly this is an existential, DX, X is a dog, CX, X wears a collar. Okay. Uh, now, uh, she says um, some things that I quoted at the, on, in part one, I think, or part one or part two, early in these Unit 17 lectures, when I was talking about, when I was, when I was speaking about the motivation for introducing this new kind of logic, and I was talking about ontology. I was saying, um, we need this logic to more accurately reflect or capture the actual complexity of English, right? Um, so the, the first argument we started with, which we couldn't capture the validity of in monadic predicate logic, but we will be able to capture the validity of in relational predicate logic, um, that had the predicate likes, right? And we said, Clegg says, we said, um, liking is not a one-place relation. It is, it, it isn't, sorry, liking is not a one-place predicate, right? It is a relation. That's its being. Right? When you say liking to capture your meaning logically, you you need a, you should properly have you should properly properly have a two-place relation. L X Y X likes Y, right? Liking, loving. These are, as discussed on three twenty-nine, transitive verbs. They have a direct object. Okay, um, and I quoted here from I quoted back then. 327 and I think 329, um, where this focus on <clears throat> the linguistic being, as it were, um, is in play. So notice how th that motivates here, how she says, in effect, she makes the point, this analysis is inadequate, we need to move to a, a better analysis, a more accurate analysis, a more true analysis. What is truth? Truth is the agreement of cognition and its object, or the agreement between thought and what thought is about. Well, logic, we're doing what? We're translating English sentences and arguments, right? So we're, it is a truer logic that agrees more with the actual nature of English. So you guys are top gun, you can handle the truer logic, you are getting the truer logic, um, the relational predicate logic, truer than monadic predicate logic. So here's what she says, um, second paragraph 327, um, right, we could symbolize it uh, like this, right, um, but here we are trying to spell out all the complexities, right? there exist complexities in English we haven't got, we're trying to spell out all the complexities, we've moved on to this true logic, um, here we're trying to spell out all the complexities and we should notice that within the predicate there is an object mentioned the collar, which stands in a particular relation to the dog, namely the dog wears a collar, 
right? It's, that's what's being said, right? Some dogs wear collars. We're saying that the dog wears a collar. And we are now gonna grasp and have the power to formally represent that wearing is a relation. And we're saying the dog stands in the wearing relation, R, X, Y, X, uh, X wears Y, to a p particular kind of object, namely a collar, okay? So continuing, we're here trying to spell all the complexities. We should notice that within the predicate, there is an object mentioned, the collar, which stands in a particular relation to the dog, namely the dog wears a collar. The most perspicuous analysis, the truer analysis. The most perspicuous analysis then is to use a separate predicate phrase for being a collar and then use a relational predicate to indicate the wearing relationship between the dog and the collar. In general, in symbolizing relational sentences, you should have a different one, vari one function variable for each class of objects mentioned and a relational predicate for each relationship. That was what I quoted back in part one. For each relationship, for each thing that is in English truly a relationship, you should reflect that in your formal language with a relational predicate, okay? Have a true analysis. All right, now, oh, notice what we do keep from uh, monadic predicate logic, the I form, the, the grasp of this as an I form. This is an, an I form, particular inclusion. Two sets, right, two classes. Um, where there's the class of dogs, there is the class of things which wear collars, and we're saying that some in the subject class are included in the predicate class. So we have an I form, and we will, in our final, final analysis, keep the I form, right? It'll be an existential, right? Where the scope goes all the way to the end, and it'll be a conjunction, okay? So we sort of, we lay that down first. Here, I've done, a this is relational predicate logic, RPL, I've done a partial analysis, okay, where I've said, my form, I laid down first. There exists an X, dot. Subject, predicate. Subject is easy, it's just dogs. <coughs> DX, X is a dog, one place, right? It's a monadic predicate, no problem. Now I've rephrased my predicate, X wears a dog. Haven't translated that yet, because that's gonna involve a little, um, that's a, a somewhat complex, analysis to get from there to what, how we're going to represent that. X wears a collar. So what did we say? Exactly what I read from Clank is what justifies this transition. Right? Translating that as um, there exists a Y such that both. Right? This is the full translation. Scope of the Y goes right, this Y, this quantifier binds these two predicates here. This whole, this propositional function that's a conjunction, whereby there exists a Y such that Y is a collar, right? There exists a collar that whereby X wears Y. There exists a Y such that both Y is a collar and X wears Y. We've got the wearing relationship, okay? Um, so we've got this quantifier binding this, notice very, very, very crucially. Many make mistakes not paying attention to this part. The scope of this X, this X binds this whole thing. So these brackets have to match up. Existential quantifier binds this guy, but this stuff is, this part is also bound by the X, right? And we have to because we've got WXY here, right? If this X did not bind this X, then this X would be free and we would not have a sentence, right? We would have a free variable and we would not have something capable of being true or false. If you don't have, if you have free variables, if the variables aren't bound, if all the variables are, aren't bound, you don't have a sentence. Okay? So this says, there exists an X such that both X is a dog and there is something which is a collar which X wears. Okay? 